I started trying to use a MIDI guitar and getting really frustrated. And then I saw that this, not this particular model, but the Eigenheart Alpha was announced. And got really interested in it because you had that intimate connection between very high resolution sensors and electronic sounds. Um, so the continuum was there way before. You were precursor to all of this. <coughs> And I had a continuum 1.2, but because it really takes a lot of time to learn, I figured that someone else might make a better use out of it. So Antonio, if you guys know him, he's, he's got my continuum. So what I'm planning on doing is just riff a little bit on the capabilities of all the things that I've laid out here. Um, I basically have set, set up nothing in terms of sounds because everything is possible. Um, if you guys have questions, we can try to figure it out, or I can try to demo it, or I can say what my opinion is. Um, and if you guys want to come over and try things out, we can try setting things up. Um, so, let me start with this little one. So this is the Eigenhart Pico. This is my first real alternative controller <coughs> that, I, that I got. And the reason I got it was I told myself a lie. I said, I'm going to buy this as a present for my girlfriend. <laughs> she didn't play it for a long time. Like, it's like, she tried it out a few times, and then that was it. I took it over, because it's actually a really, really nice controller. Um, so what it has, just like every Eigenheart, it's got keys that move in three dimensions and that are extremely sensitive. You can blow on them, and it will register wind going over them. Um, the challenge is, of course, just like with the continuum, because it's so sensitive, you really have to learn how to play it. And uh, John Lambert, who is the inventor of the Eigenharp, didn't decide, decide that he didn't want to put any rounding in at all. So it took mm -hmm. until like uh, maybe four years in the existence of the Eigenharp before some kind of rounding was added because I pushed for it. I was like, John, please. <laughs> I had it, I'd put it in like as a hidden option. I'm like, can we please express this? <laughs> so, so this is the Eigenhart Pico. The way it works is that it doesn't do anything by itself, just like most of these controllers. It requires a computer. Um, sadly, it is not MIDI class compliant because the idea is that you get very high resolution sensor data going into a dedicated piece of software that runs on a computer that's called EigenD, um, which is then able to have synthesis prim primitives that run in there so you can craft your own sounds um, and so that you can also host audio units and VSTs and control the floating point parameters of these plugins with the controls that you have on the instrument. One of the things that I personally like about this as a guitar player is that it's fretted by nature. Like I don't have to like look at it to know where where what I'm playing or where my fingers are. I can really feel around and they fall perfectly on the keys. This one, the Pico, has little hooks in the back that allow you to just hook it on your thumbs and set them the right distance and you're basically playing it as as a, as a flute or a recorder. Um, anything can be, a, can be assigned to anything. So with the piano sound, breath control is sustained. Or you have a, a rhythm control on here. One of the things that I thought was quite innovative with the Eigenharp, and we've also used uh, that idea on the instrument, but like a next level <coughs> of that, is instead of having uh, an LCD on the instrument, to use the LEDs in particular um, uh, colors and arrangements to guide the user through different capabilities of the instrument. Um, so the way that this is set up is you've got, these are the keys that are sensitive, very expressive. These are switches. So if you press on this switch, all of a sudden it provides you with another user interface that allows you to make a selection. The left side are instruments, so you can switch between different sounds or go through external MIDI. The right side is changing scales, starting a drum machine that's included, um, the, the shifting up and down in octaves, uh, transposing. So now I've got a piano sound. I don't remember these anymore, but I was super surprised this morning that I actually remembered that this 
for the instruments and then like, <laughs> oh my god I haven't played this in maybe five years but I don't remember I got it actually so this is supposed to be a physical model of a cello so I'm not that good at it anymore or you can use it with the bass control So that was my first foray in alternative controllers. What I really liked about it was it was so compact and I could really build a whole song out with it because it's got like a little sequencer that records in real time and then you can turn parts on and off and play on top of it, still be expressive, select the sounds very easily from the software that is running here. And yet we had a video once playing a sax sound while he was on a train. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. He put the, the phone camera in the seat in front of him and made the video and published it on YouTube. I was on my way to music message. <laughs> um, the downside for me is that it's very much tied to the software that's running on the computer. And none of this data is standard that is coming out of the USB cable, so without the software you can basically do nothing with it. Um, it is open source, but it's a really complex piece of software. The community is currently maintaining it, but as, as it goes with many things, it's, it really depends on people's like time and effort that they want to put into it. Maybe it's a stock make come down? No, the company's still around, but I think the Eigenharp was too much too soon, yeah. just the way that I look at it. It's got amazing ideas. So this is, this is the big one, this is the Eigenharp Tau which is similar, it's got all the same functionalities, you've got all the keys, but here you've got bigger keys that instead of being um, hollow, they're curved outwards, so you can basically wrap your fingers around it like this. And the idea being that you hold it with a strap, you know, there's also a leather strap that goes around your shoulder if you want to. If you hang it here, you can be playing chords or melody lines with your left hand, while your right hand can either do percussion or play bass, for instance. And you also have a ribbon strip controller at the back with the brass controller here that does like, similar functionalities. Um, you can play it. One of the things I liked about this one in particular is that it's super light and I carry it around in a, in a bass kit bag. Um, so I get n no problems taking it on the airplane. You just think that I'm carrying around a bass. Um, with the Eigenharp Alpha that's even bigger, I actually got in a lot of trouble in the airports because the case looks like a rifle case. <laughs> and you get into these weird situations where you get into the airport and like, you've got a rifle, you can't go through, but it's not a rifle, I'll prove to you. No, don't open the case, you can't oh, take out a rifle in the airport. <laughs> so it's not a great situation. Schro Schrodinger's yeah. rifle? Yeah. <laughs> I only tried to fly with my Alpha once. Yeah. And I had a very long conversation yeah, yeah. So, but this one is sort of the sweet spot if you want to travel with it because it sort of slots above all the carry-on luggage. The, the spaces are big enough to put it in there. What's nice is that you have a spike that can be attached to it, so you can play it sitting down, play it a little bit like a cello, where you hold it like between your legs and just rest it against your thighs, or you can actually also play it flat. Some people were doing that, where you play it as if you were playing a keyboard. Um, or play it hanging off of it. So all those different physical interaction models were really interesting to me because just like you said, Sally, earlier in ter terms of playing techniques on the continuum, the way your body aligns with the instrument that you're using dramatically influences what you're capable of doing with it, um, and how, how comfortable you feel with interacting with it. So I'm just going to blaze through, feel free to interrupt, interrupt me at any time um, and ask questions or ask me. Can I ask you a question yeah. about the Oigen Harp? I mean, when I started looking at the Oigen Harp, it seemed like there were so many ways you could configure it and orient it for playing. It was almost like yeah. I wanted somebody to tell me this was how to play it. It was almost like it was so, it was this exploratory environment and and it seemed like it was a, a good thing and a bad thing at the same yeah. time. So what, what this, like, the inventor wanted to do was basically create the maximum speed of alternative controllers, where 
everything is a primitive that you can connect together, then build that up to come up with your own way of exploring, of, of this designing your instrument. So it becomes a blank slate, and then you've got, I don't have it hooked up to the projector, I'm sorry, but you've got this piece of software where you can basically say, okay, now I want my tau. Uh, I haven't loaded this up in ages, so I don't know if this is gonna work or not. It was working with another setup earlier. So maybe that is just out of date. This is the standard setup. So it allows you to do all of the things that was, I mentioned before, but to switch between different splits, to have individual instruments in different, different rectangles, to kind of stretch them out or compress them, to um, record sequences, to transpose individual instruments, um, basically have your whole studio in here. And that to a lot of people was way too much because you had to learn that interface that is driven by LEDs by heart. If nothing would like guide you through it. You'd have to spend the time to basically not only learn how to play the instrument, but also learn how to set it up while you're playing it. Um, I personally thought that that was actually not that difficult, because as soon as you got the logic behind it, it was you know, very consistent. But for many people, that was like taking a step too far answer your question on that. Um, initially, it was even worse because John had this dream, and it is an amazing dream that I'm just getting back to with a controller I'm building for the Apple Watch, where he was sitting in a recording studio with his brother, and he was recording, and he could just ask the sound engineer, hey, can you connect my guitar through that amp with this effect without having to stand up? He could just sit there, have someone else do all the technical stuff and just stay in the zone as a musician. And what he wanted to do was to have an electronic instrument where he could do something similar. So he came up with this language that was called, and it's still called bel canto, where you play musical phrases on the instrument, like little licks that then are translated in words that create sentences that tell the environment to do something. So you can say, hey, transpose that instrument to that scale, or hey, load up that particular effect. Um, no one ever learned that language. No one was <laughs> able to actually remember Nerd, it. Nerd was it a musical, <laughs> a musical <laughs> language? You played yeah. a series of notes that yes. do that? Yes, wow. a series yeah. of notes. <clears throat> yes. It, it's <laughs> a, brilliant, a brilliant goal <laughs> to be able to do that. But that pushed away so many users, because initially he actually didn't even want to have a UI on the computer. He wanted everyone to learn the language. <laughs> but you had to have a computer. Yeah. You had to have a computer, but without a UI. Right. So you would just long, that's why it's called Ag and D, like a demon running in the background. You wouldn't even notice that it was there, and you would just like use it. Like just play little licks and like doo -doo 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 -doo, and it would do something and doo -doo -doo -doo, would do something else. Um, then realized that many people didn't want to spend the time learning that, but then we're like three or four years later and like invested a lot of money and time in building out a visual tool to do all of that. But by then, I think sort of the name already was, people had already recognized it as being too complex. Yeah. So, so that's the Eigenhart. Did, did they ever add MP to EigenD? Well, sort of. I did parts of it. Well, yeah, um, I, I figured an idea. Yeah, it's not 100%. It doesn't respond to the NRPN message. Or R right. Is it RPN now? Do we get an RPN? Yeah, it's, it's become oh, an RPN. R6 or whatever. Yeah, R6. it's become an RPN now. Um, it doesn't do that, but it's got all, all the rest. So, so yeah, it, it doesn't. So, after that, I basically ran into this guy at Moogfest um, five years ago? Yeah, we knew each other before. But so, at Moogfest five years ago, we had a talk together where I demoed the Eigenharp, we demoed the prototype of the instrument, 
and we started working on it. And they're like, some of the things are similar in that it's also fretted. The nice thing, though, is that on an eigen harp, if you want to do a glissando, you can't, because you just, it is fretted, but it's, there's huge space there. You will rock the key, go to the next one, it will rock to the opposite side, and then, so you can't control it. While the instrument you can, you can control it very well, have a very smooth glissando, and still have the frets in place. At the same time, you also have the LEDs that guide you through a system without having an LCD that you know, dominates whatever is going on. So you've got per split settings, global settings, and to make it even easier, instead of having to learn all of this by heart, the manual is just printed at the top and the bottom. So every little cell is represented with a little rectangle at the bottom and the top, so you just read what is going on and based on what is active or not active, you know what is what it's set up as. Yeah, like the printing on the top of the continuum panel. Yeah. So this is my little baby, so I'm like hesitant on talking about it too much. I feel like I'm pushing for it myself, but um, push away. <laughs> I don't know, someone else might be sitting here that has an too. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what I really like about the instrument, having been involved in it for so long, just like what Ed just mentioned earlier, it, it's been like a journey of discoveries. You, you have this technology that you adopt and then over the years discover how you can make things better. Like it's been a whole process getting to velocity that feels just natural. Like being able to play piano sounds with it, hook it up, class compliant USB, you can hook it up to anything, play piano sounds, and the velocity feels the way you would expect it. But then at the same time, you can also have continuous pressure and assign it to something that would react to that, and you have, you have a feel that also feels natural and controls well. Um, at the same time, also keep control over like the challenging multi-dimensional axes, what will happen if you press down but you, you, you rock upwards to the y-axis, what, what happens when you go over the little cells and the pressure changes a little bit but you still want to have it by ear remain consistent without removing control from the user. Um, also how to figure out what the rounding factors are so that people can step up to it, play in tune, but don't feel like when they're starting a glissando or a vibrato that they're disconnected from the pitch changes. And that, we worked a lot on like, all those little details, just like, like, like you guys, to try to find what really fits that particular instrument, like which algorithms make it feel natural, as if no work had been done, basically. <laughs> like, that's what you want. The people just step up to it and say, hey, yeah, that does what I thought it would do. And it's all open source. It's all open source. People cont contribute really regularly. It's all on GitHub. Um, there's also a whole mode that allows it to be reconfigured over MIDI. It's a user firm I want for people that don't want to dig into C++, but want to use it as a blank slate. And then you can twiddle the, 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 LED, the LEDs. You can get information for each cell and reconfigure it. Uh, one of the things that I did with that was, no, the name escapes me. Um, there's a company that makes teaching software for uh, pad controllers. Um, Melodics? Yeah, Melodics. Um, they also had like a scripting language to integrate controllers into their ecosystem. And so by the fact that their system was well documented and open, and the Eigenharp had this user firmware mode, uh, sorry, the instrument had this user firmware mode, if you connect the instrument up to Melodix, all of a sudden, boops, it's going into user firmware mode, and you get the UI that is displayed on screen in Melodix without actually having to do any firmware upgrades. It's all over MIDI. So that, that's, that's pretty fun. Um, that's about it for the instrument that I can say off the top of my head. Any questions about it? I guess Roger has told, about, you know, told a lot of things about it already. So. <laughs> of course, I'll review. Yeah. So moving on oh, from I'm that. Sorry, I just have one question. Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to do the smaller version? I, I guess that's where I just to have a, a cheaper one. Uh, it was always it in was the like plans. a price point decision, what? a price point for, for yeah. your clients. Yeah, the, uh, this, the smaller one's nine ninety nine, and the big one's fourteen ninety nine. But the funny thing is, is that I sell less of the smaller ones than the big ones 
So it's kind of like when people say, if they, people are interested enough to buy one of them, they say, well, I might as well pay $500 yeah. more and get the Yeah, I mean, one. speaking as a, as a sort of poor person, uh, $1,000 and a 1500 isn't that big of a difference to even do yeah. So it's like, if you're going to go with 1000 you might as well go with the 1500 And it's actually, it's not so bad because I make less profit proportionally on the small one yeah. than the big one, because it's almost the whole thing is the same inside, except for size, the circuit boards, and some chips, but it's mostly the same components. I, um, <clears throat> I just thought it would be, there's always this component of portability, yeah. and you know, since yeah. people are very concerned that they're a gigging musician and they travel on the plane, everything, every time you can save a little bit of size. Is yeah, a Europe huge likes more because there's more people without cars there, and they put it in the backpack. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it comes with a, a neoprene sleeve case, which makes it very compact, whereas the big one has a folding zipper padded case. So it is. It, it all of all in, uh, together, it's more compact. Yeah. I prefer the small one personally uh, because like, it fits in my backpack. Yeah. And I can take it anywhere. Yeah. It just, <laughs> you, you've got. I've got my laptop and like the iPad Pro pouch that is supposed to be together with the laptop holds the instrument 128 perfectly. So I just always have it with me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually bought. 128 after I bought the full size one just because it fits in my lower bag. Yeah, there you go. And I want to travel on one. Yeah. I think the big one is, is mostly good if you're going to do two handed play. There's a lot of people that do that, two, two, two handed piano style of play. Um, and other than that, it's kind of like if you had, if you're a guitar player um, and you're doing solo runs and you had a guitar that's uh, 24 frets or one, that, one that's uh, 15 frets. Uh, because the small one is 15 frets plus open string, the big one is 24 frets <coughs> plus open string. And you find if you're doing a run, if you, you're blocked at the 15th fret, uh, it would affect your play. Randy, yeah. sort of, I wonder if I do this question, but okay. what's the most possible Sorry, orientation for, for, for playing? Yeah, yeah. Or just, I've seen most people playing a flat play like this. Yeah. Yeah. And wasn't there hardware, uh, mounting hardware? Uh, there's, you can put yeah. like so little right. guitar yeah. strap yeah. pins oh, okay. in here and, and you just wear it with a regular guitar strap. Um, you can actually use all four of them to have it like that in front of you with like little shoulder straps. Oh. Um, so I've seen some people use that. Um, but yeah. You use the platform if you're selling popcorn at ball games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this, this, this small one, how many pads? I'm sorry? This small one, how many pads? And the small one, how many pads? Oh, uh, pads, no yeah. pads? No, this no. 128. 128 on the small one and 200 on the big one. 200? Not, not, to, not 256, right? 200. No, no, 200. Okay. Because 200 is uh, 25 columns, which is exactly two octaves times eight rows. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> And you can use it. You can use it also like, to display messages. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. You? <laughs> it's little things like that that makes it fun. Like, it, it, it took me like two weeks to allow that to be edited on the uh, on the instrument and then <laughs> the letters and then standing across the room like. Hey kids, can you read that letter that is not even eight by eight okay. pixels but still has to make sense? <laughs> you also you made it sort of like the mini yeah. uh, QWERTY keyboard. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the little things you can hook it up to the computer, and then there's a helper software that can run, and you switch it. It's also like user firmware mode. You switch it so that it becomes a QWERTY keyboard. You just type on it, and then you switch it back, and it becomes a, like uh, an alternative controller. Um, yeah, open source is cool for that. Other questions? Okay, I'll move right along to this little baby wow. that I absolutely love. It's called the Leap Motion. It costs a hundred bucks. I think it's even less now. And yeah, it's like we made it. Um, they initially wanted to use that for computer control. Found that it was too much too soon for people. Again, people really didn't latch onto it. What is beautiful about it is that it's really high resolution and low latency. Um, and currently they're going into VR. So mounting this on VR headsets, they're working on a new headset that has it incorporated. What I did with this, for those that don't know, maybe tell them what it actually senses. It's the whole, yeah. it redraws your whole hand. Right. So there's like, there's three infrared cameras in there that take pictures of your hands, and then they've got an algorithm that interpolates and matches up all the imagery so that it can detect your fingers. Um, nice, they've got a nice little visualizer here. 
I'm sorry for the guys in the back. I should have really. Oh, this is like the images that you see. Did you want to look it up here? That maybe that would be a good time. idea. Yeah, it won't be uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People want to come up closer. They can certainly do that. I don't want to come up. Closer. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it won't quite. Yeah, all those down there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. 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 I do I plus out. And curse them too. I thought somebody came out with a, uh, a hard shell case for MacBooks and it's a door thing. USB hard shell case. Mm -hmm. Just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Screen on. Yeah, what do you A couple of stuff with less. He's got the good Apple stock and Dustin Bumble stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I get angry when I have to pull out my little thing to hook up HDMI or any other thing. Oh, that's one that's one What's it? Oh, it could be glassy. Not in very much. It makes sense. It needs the designer wax. It's a white floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I have good curves. And these are the fire water devices. There's a lot of other plastic cases left in my It's like, it's a stand. 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 So you can see the image of my hand here, it's actually two images, and then they will interpolate and create like very precise representations of your fingers and like a skeletal model that models all the phalanges and like you can cross them, you can like rotate, you can make, make a fist which sometimes is a It's amazing bit. how accurate it is. Yeah. One of the things that sort of doesn't work, they were working on that before moving to VR, is touching. Um, sometimes it does work. I think it worked out the occlusion. Yeah. Hidden. Yeah, you can't, yeah, because uh, some yeah. fingers. And that's why, that's why I couldn't use it. I wanted to set it underneath the Theramine's antenna, volume antenna. Yeah. But, but when uh, the, the antenna is uh, obscuring parts of my hand, it oh, disappears. Yeah. 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 So Sally, you had a question? Yeah, that's, what, what is, that's the lead motion. That's the lead motion. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, so just, this is just their visualizer, just to show you what the little device does, right? So what I did then was build this piece of software called Gecko. Oh, you do? <laughs> Is that what you use for insurance? Yeah, I use it. No, no I couldn't, I couldn't. We were basically... Oh, okay. <laughs> So it gives you an interface that allows you to map MIDI messages to your hand position. So you can see the bar going out. It's basically the inclination of my hand. And when it's closed, it's a different message than when it's open. And you have that for all three axes, left, right, up, and down. Every time for your hand closed and open. <coughs> nice thing about that is that um, you can you can set something, leave it there, set something here, leave it there, pick that up, and then switch back and forth between your messages. So open and close is like 
it's almost like you're grabbing something and then you change what you're doing and you pick it back up. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually been way more popular than I thought it would. Like, so a lot of people have integrated that with many different setups, all kinds of music styles. Um, the, the challenge was that it's only continuous controls. Why? Because I couldn't find a way to reliably um, have people trigger specific actions in space. You, you know what? I thought you made a solution in there. No. Where, where it snaps, you set the set a threshold and then you exceed that threshold and it snaps to 127. Yes, like, like there's a solution to snap and not to send out notes. Oh, oh notes, okay. You yeah. Know. So that's sort of the most <laughs> common request is that people want to play melodies with it, like play no. notes, but then you get into the whole theremin problem. Like, uh, what is their reference point? Uh, where where are you and how do you lay out the notes? And um, what is like what is the, the heuristic for deciding where the boundaries are? Um, I was really excited when they were improving their driver software. At one point, they were working on this, and that would have been really cool, where you could be like, okay, I touch these two fingers, and it's almost like playing on flute. You hold the notes down, and I'm playing this note, playing that note, go through the scale, and at the same time, like interact with the expression in that way. Um, well, Sadly, what sorry. Why did what stopped them from doing that? Um, because they, they couldn't get the information due to how things were touching the resolution. They couldn't get it to work reliably. Um, so there are some phys physical limitations as to what you can do with your hands that it will yeah understand. Okay. Yeah. So I decided with that piece of software to focus on what it does really well, which which is the position of your palm in space with different inclinations. And it turns out that it's actually really, really convenient because it's similar to pitch and mob wheel, it's similar to a rhythm controller, it's similar to uh, the touche that's the whole product on its own there, where you complement something that you're doing with an expressive addition. Um, but then there's people that have built out whole soundscapes where they, the only thing they do is explore the different aspects of drones <laughs> that they manipulate with their hands. Um, so that's that's Gecko. Currently, they're diving head deep into the VR segment, so rewriting all their software for it. There is not a Mac version for the latest version of the software, so I personally intend on continuing with this product as soon as they bring out a Mac version of the, of the new driver software. Yes, sir? Have you, have you been talking at all with Adam with the Nemo team? Um, not one on one. I've sort of stepped up to them, and they were like, it was two years ago when they were trying a, a lot to get it stable. Yeah, here, and I want to show you because I'm, I'm on their uh, beta now. You do? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you what they have right now. Cool. Yeah. Basically, they've integrated some some deep into their clever, and it does oh, do a little bit of it's very uh, feature rich. It's got lots of, you can see it. Okay, so, okay. so yeah. yeah. Awesome, cool, yeah, looking forward to that. Any other questions about this? Cool, right on. Except that uh, your dongle is larger than the big motion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the controller is the smallest thing yeah. in there. Did you bring, um, did you bring this uh, Mayo? I didn't bring, so there's another one that I worked on. Uh, it's the Mayo armband that is supposed to measure uh, with ex accelerometers and gyroscopes positioned in space also, they had a hu and still have a huge problem basically stopped support and development. And they couldn't solve drift. Mm -hmm. So you could not reliably pick, pick even ranges. Like you would start here and there and then a minute later it would be over there. Mm -hmm. So that made it really hard to actually perform with unless you wanted to be in some sort of chaotic state where everything changed around you all the time, which can be fun, but it's not very, like, it, it's not a product that is easy to, to, to sell to users. So I, I didn't really do anything more with that. Um, thank you for bringing that up. So there was the Mayo. Then I, I tried out Rolly, but this is their later keyboard, so I'm not going to talk about that uh, first. 
right when we were doing the instrument, like two years in, I think, these people started a Kickstarter, Sensil, which is a Sensil Morph, which is basically a pressure sensitive surface that is extremely high resolution again, can measure very, very soft uh, touches up to extremely strong touches, works all the way from brush strokes up to hitting it for a percussion. Um, and one of the unique things that they have is, the, I don't know what a technology is. I think it is just ma magnetic. It's magnetic. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just magnetic. Yeah. Oh, everyone knows it. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't know the sensor more? <laughs> you. Okay, cool. So they've got magnets in these overlays that allow the controller to identify what the overlay does. And then a computer editor that allows you to reassign what the different things on your controller do. So you could actually have multiple of these and just slap them in, or have, like, this is their latest overlay, which is a Bukla yeah. uh, Thunder. <laughs> so you basically swap that in, and as soon as it gets in there, it will start acting as this overlay. Um, this one, I'm really, has anyone actually used a sensor morph? Or yeah. just know of it? He has one right there. <laughs> yeah, one right there. <laughs> if you've never touched this, I'm very impressed with the quality yes. of these overlays. I thought that when I was backing this on Kickstarter, there was going to be like, a shitty feel that I wouldn't want to touch. But it's very, very pleasant. And even these, like, these rounded controls that they have here, they're slightly hollowed out with a little ridge on the edges that your fingers nicely grab into, and it's satisfying. It, I, I think that they did an amazing job with this. Um, also, as a company, they've continued to support it in their firmware and software and improved it and added MPE support, and like this one now had got MPE support and they brought this one out. And this one has additional capabilities where none of the others do that, where you can use this button to switch through different configurations. Mm -hmm. So you can set up your Thunder in one way, a little bit like what we have on the instrument, you hold down a button and then select a mode to switch it into another configuration. So you could have it set up as individual sliders for something and then switch to another mode where it is uh, an interface that plays musical notes in a particular key and you switch to another mode and you would switch to another key or different controls. Um, so I'm still really starting to explore this one because the overlay came out at MoCFest this year, which was now like a month ago. Um, but I'm excited by this device. I, I think it's, it's very well made. You can use it both wired over USB when then it charges its internal battery and then over Bluetooth wireless. So you can use both modes. Um, interestingly, they also have this overlay where you can use it as a typing keyboard <laughs> and it's got very little travel and it feels better than Apple's chiclet keys, um, which is kind of yeah. remarkable. Um, <laughs> it, their little mouse pad is horrible, but the typing keyboard, the first time you experience that where you're like, okay, I'm playing this musical like piano keys and you just flip that out and all of a sudden it just detects it as a typing keyboard. You don't have to do anything else. The computer switches. It's it's quite amazing. It's like, Although my coffee machine does that. Yeah? It's yeah. also a typing keyboard? Yeah, no, it has the bar <laughs> barcode <laughs> in the capsule. <laughs> and it brews it yeah. custom. Yeah. 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 Have you played really much without the overlay? Yeah. Um, yeah. I've just done yeah. tests with it. So I, I was planning on, like when that came out, I was like, okay, I'm going to do something similar as what I've been doing with other devices. Like what can I build to turn in, this into a nice musical controller? But they've done such a great job at it that I'm like, okay, it doesn't make any sense for someone else to do anything. Because Tim Thompson Space Palette. Yeah, Tim Thompson has like four of them. It without the overlay. Yeah, yeah. And I have never thought to play mine without it. Yeah. And I really like to feel without the overlay. Cool, okay. I should try that. It's worth playing with. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, what's the technological hurdle to getting USB host into a device like that? Because the thing I absolutely hate is I don't like using a computer. It just it kills my okay. creation process, mm -hmm. and I have to bring in an external device to function as a host to 
drive the synthesizer. But I just don't quite understand why. Why do I need this little? But this is class compliance. You can plug this into any device that supports a USB device or Bluetooth device. Well, what about the, the MIDI interface? Well, you could. If you have this is a MIDI interface that has used a USB host on it. So it depends on the products that you have. Mm -hmm. um, now, the only other option they would have had was to have like small uh, MIDI, MIDI jack that you could connect. It. But then it's sort of in, in this particular product, it would defeat their purpose because they would become targeted to the musician. Where the idea is this is a blank slate with a bunch of capabilities that are reconfigurable, and they came up with a nice collection of idioms that allow you to basically morph it, that's the name, morph it between different identities. Um, Some people use this uh, like an art drawing kind of Yeah, mm -hmm. as a game controller, as a video editing, um, like one of the things they did, I'm not sure if this is charged, yeah, it is. Um, Those mini jacks are really big. Yeah. I have to file them off to fit them in the instrument. Like this, this is for instance, I well, think this was really clever. Like they, they don't have an LCD, but they have LEDs here. Mm -hmm. So when you use a control, the LEDs <coughs> will actually show at the top which values are being sent out. Mm -hmm. So they, they came up with a series of primitives that create their world. And adding mini chat to that would be a little bit defeating their purpose, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, the bottom line is I can't use it. Um, I'm going to use it with a Zero Coast, and I have like a, a retrofit um, USB host device, you know, mm -hmm. very very small. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's some something at USB level that uh, as soon as I plug the USB host into that using the USB cable, that device almost like it, it just shuts it down. Um, hmm. So, in, in my world, it's maybe easy. maybe maybe you're connecting a client at a host store, have some of the things switched around. No, I don't have the users that document it, but it's just uh, hmm. that, which comes back to the yeah. point of you know, in the old days. Yeah. Uh, to me, a USB um, MIDI interface was just simple USB cable and MIDI dongle. Yeah, very very clean. Well, this this should be able to do that. If it's not, then yeah, mm -hmm. something's weird. I've definitely hooked this up to a lot of different devices without any problems. Well, I guess in the modern world, what people call USB inter or a MIDI interface is like that iConnect or something similar where it's this huge block. I guess I'm talking back in the day where it was just the, mil the most minimalist one part in to a little... But there were DIN MIDI, right? Those, those weren't USB. There weren't USB, the, those were DIN MIDI boxes. It was like a little round... Really different thing. Yeah. Same, no. same, same data, yeah. well, there's essentially, but electrically very different. Mm -hmm. okay. So moving on from the, any questions about this and some more? Just for people to know, they've now actually opened up their technology for other integrations and OEMs, uh, larger and smaller surfaces. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Right? And also I think it's only $200, isn't it? I think it's a bit think more, it's a but yeah, it's like three ninety nine or something. Oh. But it's, I think it's a standard for yeah. 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 well, what it is. It's it's uh, remarkable. The the impression that I get, just to comment, is that you know that is a really nice, <coughs> as far as an interface that ex explains itself to you in a split second. Yeah. Th this is what it does, and yeah. you can look at it and immediately. No. And that to me is the exact opposite of the, the, the Eigenhart. Yeah. The Eigenhart yeah. is like whoa, like a everything is completely obscure to you, you know that you can do a lot, but there's nothing self-explanatory about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a very good observation. Yeah, so I think that the uh, more, the total surface is scanned normally every eight milliseconds, but they have a low resolution, mm -hmm. low latency mode, yeah. which scans the whole thing, and, and it reduces the X and Y accuracy by uh, half each, and then it scans the whole thing in two milliseconds. Yeah. Which is, it's I mean, works for, uh, that's only a problem if you really had some critical music stuff. I hope you're trying to make onset and stuff, but yeah. 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 So, oh, I the mm -hmm. Jouet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess everyone knows these. Do I have to talk about them? <laughs> Do I have to? Do I have to talk about them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will, I will talk about this one. Like, 
the, like this is the first version of the blocks here. I think the second version, I'm gonna make it very short, the second version is way better than the first version. Yeah. It sort of revised the sensibility, sensitivity and the whole like react, reactiveness. But I think there's still ways of, of, that's just my personal opinion, of these particular blocks being awesome. Because they just have user interface issues where you fall off the edges. When you get near the edges, you lose precision. Um, connectivity difficulties. There's like LEDs behind the surface, but they're like, there's this film over it that makes it feel weird. Anyway. Has the battery gotten better? Mm, I don't know about the new ones, but the old ones aren't that great. No, my old ones are yeah. awful. This, it this one charges a whole yeah. charge for it. Yeah. This one, though, even though I'm not a fan of the seaboard because I'm not a piano player, I personally think that they nailed their concept with this one. If you ever wanted to try out the seaboard and you haven't tried out the seaboard blocks, they finally did what I had been talking to uh, Roland about Roland yeah, for since the beginning. They have a very small flat surface at the top of the, of the waves here. Instead of it being completely round, that both the seaboard rise have and the grand before that, meaning that it was really difficult to hold your finger here, you would always slide off of it. And whenever you started being expressive with it, you would have artifacts being introduced. Mm -hmm. While in the blocks, seaboard blocks, it's got this little surface at the top that is flattened out and makes that, I think, way better. Um, and you get all the capabilities. Are that is still equidistant? And you got the same like technology of the rest of the seaboards. Um, so this where C between C and I mean between the two Y keys. Yeah. The, the spacing's yeah. maintained like a piano. Yeah. It still feels crazy. and it's only three hundred dollars. Yes, this one is cheap, three hundred dollars. You can connect a few of them together if you want to get a wider one. Yeah, it has a magnetic connection to any other uh, blocks in the block series. They have a loop block. They have a control block. They this have the, the developer the block, panel. which just has numbers. Okay. Yeah, and then you can't really do anything with it. <laughs> no, for real. I'm sorry to say that. They sold me that, like, hey, you can get the developer kit for free. Like, a month later, they end of life it, and now you basically can't do anything with this block. <laughs> oh, wait, go around. <laughs> uh, so I said for free or for 20% off. Thank you. Um, Moving on to Jouet, which I think is, is beautiful. I do it's, too. It's, it, yeah. it's got this wooden finish. It's like feels, a Linster Mini. It's yeah. like a Linster <laughs> Mini. Um, it's the same guy that did, um, God, I've gone to the Jazz Mutant Lemur. Lemur. Did the Lemur? Okay. Um, Pascal Jouquet. Yeah. Oh. And it's got a similar idea as a Sensor Morph, where you have overlays and they have different identities. Um, their idea is that you can actually mix and match. So you can just lay them down and have, okay, I want this configuration. And then you can, you can take these two out and put this one. And there's a computer editor that allows you to configure what all of these do. And they also maintain identity. So you, you can have multiple ones of these with different configurations and just in the middle of your piece, like plug this in and it will automatically switch to it, um, which is pretty neat. Is this, uh, did this come out before or after the, the sense of? After. Okay. Yeah. It was a bad, came out about one to two years ago. Yeah. 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 Um, we made it in France. It's okay. over a year ago because somebody at the last continuing yes. used one in his performance. Mm. Antonio. Were, yeah, were there, exactly. it looks like there's some, um, like there would be some, shared patents between those two? I don't know. I know that, the, that, the, that these have a few going on because this is Touche yeah. and this is Jouet. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> not like the same company. Okay. Do I have to wrap up? I'll take a picture. Oh, okay. Um, How are you the Z sensitivity on that? So, in terms of usability, I have to admit that in the last six months I haven't done much with it because their initial firmware, I thought, didn't got the sensitivity right. So I, I felt it was okay to trigger things, but to actually express and perform with, it was still off. And I know there's been two updates since and I haven't tried it out. So 
I, they keep working on it, and given given the, you know, the guys that are working on it, I think they will figure it out. They will, they will, they will, they will get it good. Just like all of our other instruments, it takes time to, mm -hmm. to explore what the capabilities of their sensors are. Um, it's got a USB-C connector, which I really like because I've got a USB-C Mac. Um, but if you move into that domain, it is really convenient that you can use any of your other cables. Um, and it's bus powered. So what I like is that they try to be innovative in that you've got these little balls that you can sort of experiment with and it's like an XYZ mm -hmm. control so that you can sort of loosely interact and express yourself. A little bit the opposite of trying to be super precise, but okay, I'm just gonna put some motion in here. Um, <laughs> that's, I think that's pretty cool. And then here, you can come over and try, try this out. Um, they also have, sim similar to uh, this overlay on the morph where you have like a rotary dial, they also have a rotary dial, but they have little notches on the edges so that you feel where you are. Um, mm. So that without looking, you have multiple spaces that you can be in. Um, and like the feel is also great. Like they spend a lot of time figuring out um, how to get this to, to feel like a musical instrument. This is the last one I think they brought up, which is their MPE overlay, which is inspired by, by continuum. Um, it's got a little slider program of switches. So it's similar to a Sensel, but it's really geared towards music. Like yeah. the Sensel is a general purpose mm. morph surface, while this is more like a musical interface. Um, what's unique is that you've got this like smaller pieces that you can pull in and out. Um, are there a bunch of other non-music um, non um, sensor overlays that yeah. aren't represented here? Yeah, there is the video editor one, mm -hmm. there is a gamepad one, um, and then there is a artist drawing one, I think. They asked that one? Yeah, because they were gaining enough sensitivity. Oh, for okay. It. Well, I just remembered it from the Kickstarter. Yeah, no, yeah. no. And the Sensel also has a clear overlay, yeah, and you can put a oh. thin piece of printed paper in that the one? Yeah. That's like their inno innovator's overlay. And you can see yeah. they have like 3D yeah. printer yeah, models. He, he showed me it. So this is like their clear overlay that has magnets that don't automatically shift, I think. Um, and you can 3D print within their software, lay out things, and then export that 3D print and put it well, I thought it was just you could put a piece of printed paper underneath If you it. want to. But you can also 3D print if you want to have tactile control. But would it actually adhere to it? Because it's silicone. Well, I haven't tried it. Did they say there's, that? A whole, there's a whole segment on Did their they website about a specific, a specific um, filament that you would use to they, make the. Yeah, they, they have rec recommended yeah. filaments on there. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> Is the uh, overlays kind of limited in the number of ways they can identify themselves if they're just using magnets? I, do, I don't know how that technology works. You can't you can change that nature. So it's only them that can like put it in the firmware and it will detect the predetermined overlays that they ship. Um, if you want to do it yourself, you don't have that capability. So I guess that they maybe decided there's something oh. hard coded in there that's yeah. reading. Yeah. 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 So that's not available to, to users to, to play around with. Is that done by different magnet location? Yeah, I think so. That's what it looks like. So you can sort of figure out the bits. Yeah, it's like, it's like I guess like you've gotten yeah. maybe oh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's four. It's only four, actually. Four? That's a well, four, four and a bomb, so there's an eight bit. You've got eight bits yeah. of, of item. Like, that's a lot. Like, it's still a lot, yeah, 256. <laughs> I suspect if you're a small manufacturer and you said, hey, here's a new one, they they seem like the kind of guys that would work with yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what they did with Bookla, right? Oh, and yeah, that's the, true. The Bookla Thunder. That's the first one. That they did in partnership. If, if you're interested in this, like for you also, they also did a really good job explaining how to hook this particular overlay up to modular systems, um, both with different MIDI CV converters, your options, like modules or, or standalone, um, Bluetooth ones or USB ones. Um, 
Yeah, so. what's really cool in theory with the thunder pad is those uh, octagons yeah. in either corner, yeah. they're not just pads, they're no. XY. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. and as well XYZ as in, in this case. Actually, yeah. all the pads turn yeah. into XY, so yeah. you can even color mm -hmm. outside the lines. Yeah. So, <clears throat> then this came out about two years ago, I think, mm -hmm. which is a touche. If you've never tried one, it's, I was really skeptical when I saw it being announced, but if you've never tried one, it's so sensitive and so beautiful, uh, like the touch and the responsiveness. I think this is a, a wonderful expressive controller to add on to any synth, basically, just put it to the side. It's got a nice amount of weight to it. It's a little bit rubberized on the bottom so it doesn't slide away. It's sort of this premium feel. Um, the, the, the primary intent, in case you're not clear, is you stick on the left side of, side of a MIDI yeah. keyboard, you play with the keyboard with your left hand, and you put your hand on this, and it rocks in three dimensions, but it's very well engineered. Yeah, and it's got different outputs, so either USB, but also four CD outputs go straight out if you want to go into your modular system. Um, it's, this is the like flagship, the first one came out. It's not class compliant USB MIDI. So you always have to hook it up to your computer. You have an LE or SE, I can't remember. It's LE. An LE, an LE version uh, that is only MIDI class compliant and that doesn't have the CD outputs. But it's, it's a few hundred bucks uh, cheaper. So it's, it's interesting to try out. Um, I got one of those and I think they're fantastic. Yeah. I did a video hooking up to the continuum. Yeah, Gert's right. It's very, very sensitive. Very, very well. Like you can do things like, if you see like this, oh, it's just pressure. No, you can like scrape your nails over it, and yeah. just the fact that your nails scrape over it will influence the sound. That's my or favorite you, thing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Or just picking it up between two fingers and wiggle it a little bit and get sort of like because it's <laughs> got some springiness in it. Like you get some something that keeps going on. <laughs> um, so or just tapping it like that. That, that, that that's very versatile. Yeah, they, they, they did a good job with this very simple um, user experience and interface, like getting it into a sensitivity that allows you to, to figure out new ways to express yourself with this particular pad. The fact that it's wood, that you like to touch it, and like, like to put your fingers on, I think makes a big difference. Do you have any idea what kind of business they're doing with it? If it's been received in a way that that is Excess. Everyone I know that has tried it likes it. I've yeah. seen them around way more often than they used to. Um, yeah. They seem to have some money. So, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You they, do, you know, their whole yeah. marketing, like, yeah. it's clearly well. driven by investors. But yeah. I don't know. Well, sometimes critical successes can go nowhere, you know, I know. for a weird reason. Yeah. 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 The first time I tried one was at NAMM a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and it was the most exciting thing yeah, same I here. saw at NAMM. Yeah. Yeah. I was just walking I, I around. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you know, you can replace the wood on top. They've got different types of wood yeah. to they, match it. I've got one to match my, uh, my uh, voice. They made a Mocus edition for it last year. Like Mocus written in gold on it. I didn't see that. So who will you buy next? What will I buy next? <laughs> well, I got the continue me. It was the, it was the last one. Um, I don't know what's what's being announced nowadays. Um, oh, that's about it. <coughs> well, well, we're working on <laughs> So there's this thing. Oh, that one, of course, yeah. Um, this is the Artifan Instrument One. It's got some interesting ideas in it. Um, in that. So it doesn't have a sound generator in it, but you can hook it up to a computer or any iOS device, and it's got a built-in speaker. So as soon as it like connects to the app, the speaker's on the it's on the here. It's on there, but the sound generator is not. Right. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, that's smart. <laughs> Where are you I'm going? going? I'm going that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going this way. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can, it's called, they call it a multi-instrument, where you, based on how you hold it, you can do different things. So you can use it as a guitar. So these would be... <laughs> and, or use it as a cello, like... <coughs> or 
or use it as a piano where you So they figured out that the interface here, you cycle through instruments, it's really intuitive, you've got a little knob here that allows you to dial in the volume, and then a multi-purpose interface here that is interpreted differently based on the instrument. <coughs> um, personally, it feels more like a toy to me than, than anything else. Forward, yeah. But if you go online and look at their community, it seems that a lot of people have a lot of fun with it. And, and make a lot of like music, like there's hundreds and hundreds of videos being recorded with this thing where people overdub themselves and only play this. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when I saw that. So and also it can recognize Z-axis, uh, yeah. but only if it at that time doesn't recognize Z-axis. Yeah. Yeah. So it's either Z or X yeah. and not Y. So I don't know, maybe, okay. Why not? <laughs> maybe like us being in this realm of being really geared towards like very expressive controllers that are becoming instruments <coughs> because they're tapping so much into the sensor capabilities. Maybe there is this segment with people that just want to have fun. Yeah. Um, it's $400. And, yeah. Um, little side note, like this is actually a classic blind speaker. So you can actually hook it up to whatever you want and have your speaker with you. You can play music through it. Um, so it's just a fun thing if you have it with you. Um, and they, they've done a lot of work on the quality of the tones. Yeah. The, the first ones were a little flaky, yeah. and they really stuck with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, know, I don't know what the history is going to be for them, but it seems that they're, like, they're still around and people are buying them. So How long has it been around? Four, yeah, three to four oh, years, four I'd say. Years. Yeah, because yeah, I, I helped them some with their their sensor probably five, six I did too. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> they need a lot of help. It, it so, takes a village. <laughs> all these instruments. Yeah. So the last thing that I worked on is when the Apple Watch 4 came out, what I've been trying to do since the Apple Watch 1 was you've got a controller on here, a physical controller, that is the digital crown that actually has a really nice feel to it. It's got haptic oh, wow. feedback, and you can use it without looking at it. So I wrote this app that allows you to use your Apple Watch and then send out and configure MIDI CC messages, and you, you dial, turn the dial, and you can have macro control over up to four knobs and configure which CC mes messages they send out. And then going further, you can have tap buttons if you just want to you know, turn things on or off. A little XY pad. Program change. And this is transport control. And I, hmm. that's actually the most useful thing on there. Because you're sitting there with your instrument. And what I always find is when I'm recording by myself, I don't want to go to the computer and like, mess around with the DAW. I just want to sit there, OK, record. Overdub, and having that on your watch is super cool. Mm. Um, additionally, like it also reacts to Siri, which is even more convenient because you just put your. If you don't have an Apple Watch, this works with Siri, and I can say, "Hey Siri, press record," <laughs> and so it will press. It will send the record transport message to the DAW, and so it, it's done. It's got no DAW connected, but it will start recording. It's like, "Hey Siri, press stop," and we'll stop. And, hey Siri. Press rewind and we'll rewind. So it's not really expressive control, but I think that if like if you're expressive and really staying in the zone, what I always find annoying is having to deal with the technical stuff. So being able to just keep that in your own space and being able to interact with the less musical aspects of things, that's pretty cool. But there is a drawback to that here. Yeah. If you write a song and the lyrics are, hey Siri, stop recording, <laughs> yeah. and then you, you never get the same. Well, then, then, then you need to see their Siri. You say, hey Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> or, can you do that? This is Siri. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's what, what's kind of interesting is I was recording a podcast. Someone had invited me to record a podcast, like uh, the Apple Insider podcast, and we're talking about it. And so I do a demo. 
I say, hey Siri, and everyone's phone goes off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, oh, maybe we should cut that out of the podcast. And he's like, no, we're going to keep that in. And so like 20,000 podcast users oh, no. listen to the podcast, and like, oh, most of them Apple users, all of them will have their phones go off like, hey Siri. <laughs> yeah. So does that work with all four editions yeah. of the Apple Watch? Yeah. 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 So that's it. If you guys want to come over and try things out, that is sort of what I had like to talk about. All right.